Ladies, gentlemen, and people of all gender identities, please welcome the liturgists. Listen, it is so good to be at the Goose. Oh my gosh, sweat and all. It is good to be at Wild Goose with you all. And uh, we thought, you know, since we're all together, we're all feeling good, we might talk about really sad things for the next hour. And that would be the best thing. Let's just get in our feelings and in our bodies and then try to act like normal people, right? That's, that's life. So uh, we've been talking a lot about why we have a podcast at all. If you know our work, you know we started out of a simple origin story of mutual loneliness. Uh, the two of us went through a faith transition, both of which were varying degrees of public. And in the process of that faith transition, kind of lost like our entire social communities. Yeah. Um, and we became friends just because somebody else was as weird as we were theologically, which is a word like we didn't even believe in anymore. And I've always thought that like what makes the Liturgist podcast great is the way we try to de-escalate different topics and really move into them. And I've recently been looking at kind of the data about why people listen to this show. And what I'm learning is you actually listen because you also feel that sense of loneliness. And that in fact, when I look at data beyond the Liturgist podcast, I see that right now, you could make a data-driven case that the West is in the greatest loneliness epidemic in human history. So there's been this really wonderful, beautiful, and necessary thing that we've all been doing together, and that's trying to tear down the bullshit institutions that oppress people. And that is important work, and that is necessary work, and it is vital ultimately for human flourishing. But as we have made a collective, unparalleled, exodus from institutions, and I don't just mean the church, I mean civic institutions, I mean charitable institutions. Modern people don't institutionalize. But the problem is those oppressive structures once provided for us some excuse to make friends with other people, right? As boring, like who would want to go objectively to a Sunday night church service and listen to like a pretty mediocre white guy <laughs> talk about the scriptures like really deep into four verses and make up what he thinks he knows about the Hebrew language as he goes. Why do people do that? Because afterwards there was casserole, <laughs> right? And then you met people you actually met people. So the common thread, you know, there's so many different kinds of people that listen to this show. Absolutely, post-evangelicals make up a big block. But everyone who listens to the liturgist is post something. And in that transition, something got lost. What you gained in freedom and in liberation you lost in ready-made community and belonging. And my concern, and all of our concern, is that often that might even lead to a net negative in your mental health. And so what we want to talk about together today is how we respond to loneliness because, do you know, the most frequently requested topic that you ask us for when you email us or post on social media is how do we build community together? And even more common as a variation is how on earth can I make friends as an adult? And the stakes are high. 
because our collective loneliness and our shift towards digital communication as our primary way of knowing other people is driving anxiety to record highs, it's driving depression to record highs, and it's even driving suicide and suicidality to unprecedented levels historically. Our epidemic of loneliness is truly a matter of life and of death. Mm. Wow. I was just, yeah. I was just in Japan on a solitude retreat um, for like 10 days by myself. And I, I'm a dad. Um, this is Michael Gunger, by the way. We should, we should remember to identify. Did you identify this Science Mike? I'm Science Mike. <laughs> We're trying to remember, like for people that just start listening to the program, sometimes we don't introduce ourselves. We're like, who's talking? Um, <laughs> hi, I'm Michael Gunger. And on this solitude retreat, um, it was weird. I, in Japan, it was actually worse than in America as far as the isolation. Like you go into a train station or something and there'd be thousands of people, silent. And literally like almost every person, you get on the subway, like every person. It was weird, it was like a sci-fi movie. Um, this whole train is silent, absolutely silent, every single person. And we see traces of that in America, too. I mean, it, not just traces of it. We're going there, it seems like. But to see it, it seemed even more so like that there. And it was weird to feel, after 10 days, as a person who feels normally <laughs> inundated with humanity, <laughs> um, I live in a pretty crowded and loud household, and it's beautiful, and then we have lots of friends and people around all the time. Um, so 10 days in this, this is a single person that can't really speak, that can't speak their language and just being in a sea of humanity that was also very isolated was one of the more lonely experiences that I've ever had, uh, even though I was surrounded by people. By the end, I was literally kind of like fantasizing about just hugging a stranger. <laughs> I was just like, can, can someone look at me and s tell me they love me? <laughs> you know, it's just like... I just want to be touched. I just want to be uh, loved. And I think we all feel that. And I was just, what you were saying, Mike, really just struck me. And when I think about um, friendship as an adult, you know, when we grow up in school and we grow up in all these structures, usually, that there are other people around that are natural friendships. And then our society seems to, the way that we build society, and then you move into like family time stage where you find a partner, you have kids. This is kind of the general script that people are handed, right? This is a, uh, and then you focus on that. And then what? Like when I look at my parents, and this is not data, but mo my parents and all their friends, um, they're all pretty lonely. Because all the kids now are out of the house. And they don't, they don't seem to have super close-knit Friendships. The people that are involved in churches, they have their church friends and stuff. Um, but it's, it's made me kind of sad seeing some of my parents' age friends that, like, how the movement of life has left them in this really lonely, isolated place as empty nesters. Um, and so I've wondered, like, what's, what drives that and what can I do to to not end up there, or we just end up in these like isolated, lonely places. What's going on? I don't. That's all just anecdote. Do you, anybody got any data or anything for us? <laughs> Hillary, maybe you're good. Well, as you're talking, I was thinking about this group that I run. Um, I'm finishing up my residency right now, and I run a therapeutic group called a process group. And instead of like a, a psychoeducation group where people come in and we say here are the few things that cause depression. Do things differently when you leave this room. A process group is about people connecting with themselves and exploring the patterns of how they connect to other people. So we actually talk the entire time about what's happening in the room as it's happening. Which when I told you about it, Mike, you were like, that sounds terrifying. Because <laughs> sometimes we do this for like up to eight hours. Those are called like immersive psychodynamic like process groups. But the idea is that you're exploring your inner barriers to connection. 
And as you're doing that, other people will say things like, well, you know, so-and-so, you haven't said anything, this group. Why haven't you said anything? And people will kind of call you out on the way that you pull yourself back and disconnect as a strategy. And at the end of this group, I just finished another cycle, we had someone in the group kind of head in hands crying, saying, I've met you for eight weeks now, once a week, and I have never felt this close with any of my friends. And so what is it about friendship that, that we're not doing the kind of work that we need to with each other to let ourselves be seen? And I think that if we step back, before we even get to the point where we're you know, spending time with someone extended periods of time or letting them into our pain or struggles, I think about something called social identity theory, which is a way of understanding like, how we categorize and group people based on when we first encounter them. And we have data that shows under a minute after meeting someone, you have already decided if they're in your in-group or out-group. And you might not even know any information about their life. This, a lot of times, has to do with how they look, how they hold themselves, their mannerisms, their gait, how they dress, if they gesticulate. So, yeah, that's a funny word. How you, how you express yourself with your hands, how you gesture. Although I had a, a friend in high school say, if this is gesticulating, are these your gesticles? As she points to her hands. Yes. I just thought I'd drop that in there. But the idea is that within a few seconds of meeting someone, we're deciding, am I like you or am I not like you? And what we see over time is that when we decide that someone is in our out group, when someone is not like us, that we have some sort of barrier between connection, that our assessment of the differences between us and them grow over time. So nothing actually changes, but our perception of how different we are increases. And interestingly, a similar phenomena is that in-group bias increases. So who you think you are like, your in-group, your perception of how much you are like them also increases over time. So over time, we are creating these divides between them and us. And that all of that happens before we even meet a person and get to know them. So think about wow. what happens then if we're actually getting to the point where we're in a, in a conversation. We have already overcome a huge amount of barrier just to just say that we are like someone. But my challenge is how can we see that more people are like us? What is it like to say, my instinct says you are in my out group, but to say, on the inside, there is something bigger that connects us that means that just because you are alive, you are in my in-group. Mm. There is this thing that happened um, when I started grad school, so anyone who's a therapist or has done any like social work, counseling, training, uh, you know that we practice doing therapy on each other. So I started grad school and I had done lots and lots of therapy in my own life, but there's all sorts of new challenges that come up when you are learning to enter a profession that you're hoping helps other people, where you're expecting other people to let you see their vulnerability. And I remember at the end of the first semester, uh, I came home and said to my husband, oh, my, you know, my best friend, Kelsey, is coming over. And he's like, best friend? You've known this girl three months? Like, this is not your best friend. And I remember saying to him, but, but we're doing things in our relationship with each other that have taken you years to do with your friends, which is that we're letting ourselves be seen. And not just in the things that we think are interesting and trying to convince each other of how good we are and how much we should be liked, but in, in the painful places and asking for help asking for help of each other. So we think about some of the barriers to connection. There's the in-group, out-group bias, but there's, there's also like, how much am I willing to let myself be seen and to see other people? Am I trying so hard to make friends and be liked that I'm talking all the time or I'm just talking about the best parts of me? And can we share in a common experience of risk-taking that would allow us to maybe create a a sense of commonality that goes beyond some of the things we normally think of as being the in-group, out-group bias. So that's how I see it from a clinical perspective, but to take it out of 
like the, the therapy land. What I was wondering about William is, um, I know you've had some people in your life who've been really important to you. And do you want to set this up? Like, yeah. Me? Yeah. Well, we were talking about at lunch. Or, yeah, because yeah. we, were, we were talking about, we were just, we tr it's funny when we talk about the conversation beforehand, we're always kind of like, we try to pay attention to where the, we don't want to get too much juice. We're like, shh, shh, stop. We'll talk about that later, but we want enough to like, where are we going to go? Um, and one of the things that kind of came up in the conversation was the difference when we're talking about adult friendships between somebody who's in like a family situation like I am, or William, um, who's single, he's an adult living in this huge city of Los Angeles. I was curious about how friendship has changed as you've gotten older, um, even though your living situation, because I don't know how much of the difficulty in making friendship is based on just fi family and all that stuff versus like people getting older, lives changing, and they're just, what is it like for you now versus what it was like, you know, when you're a kid or young yeah. and making friends? Well, I think there's something basic about trying to make friends that makes you feel like you're back in the second grade. Uh-huh. You know that feeling <laughs> where you're like, hi, <laughs> my name is so-and-so. I'm like, oh, nice to meet you. And like you say, all those like judgments are kind of like you're sizing them up and what do they look like and are, are they the type of person you would hang out with or are, are you attracted to them or are you not attracted to them? Like all those like <laughs> feelings. Uh, feelings. Sorry. Uh, all those things happen. I think for me, as I'm 35 and I'm single, um, I, the one thing I've had to cope with as being in my 30s and single is that the majority of my friends got married. And so their priorities change. And so it's like, I not only have to love them, I have to love their spouse. And I not, not only have to love their spouse, I have to love their children or their dogs. Like, <laughs> right? Like, it's, it's a whole thing. It's like, it's always a, a package. Are and you so, trying to say something about my dog, William? I'm just saying, there are a lot of dogs in my life. <laughs> my dog loves William more than most of my other family members. Yeah, yeah. Your, your dog loves me. But I'm, I'm going to be honest, there's about five other couples in L.A. that have the same story. Oh! <laughs> he gets around, what can I say? Wow. <laughs> wow. Um... <laughs> <laughs> I'm a dog favorite ouch, in L.A. Ouch, William. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Will is not the only dog in my life. Uh, no, that's... <laughs> her name is actually Willa, too. Um, <laughs> not after me, though. That was a whole weird conversation me and your daughter had to have. Um, <laughs> I was like, that's you true. named her after me? She that's was like, no, because I knew another dog named Willa. And I was like... All right, okay. <laughs> couldn't, she, she couldn't lie to me. I felt like I was seven years old at that moment. Like, just lie to me, Amelie. I lie to me. Uh, but to answer this question, I don't know how we got on this train. Um, I've had to cope with the fact that my friends have, like, relationships, like marriages and, and partners and kids. And, like, so now when I show up, like, I, people think I live this, like, party lifestyle in LA I'm like I'm mostly going to kids birthday parties I feel like <laughs> and I just had to accept that as a 35 year old like my life is my friend's kids birthday parties but I know there's always going to be alcohol there so I, like, I'm definitely like hey 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 <laughs> Uncle William's here <laughs> give me a margarita <laughs> what are we talking about <laughs> Like that's, and so truthfully, there is a, there's like a, I'm laughing about it, but there's a real pain attached to that because you're like, I mean, there's especially like, like, like male to male platonic friends. It's like, wait a second. Like we just can't even be that close because you're giving all your vulnerability to your wife <laughs> and then you just don't really have a lot left over. And I just found that, that a lot of like my married male friends, like that's a, a real struggle for them. Cause men in general, you know, they're, they're vulnerability relation tanks like this anyway and so when they have to like give you know to their kids or to their wife they have very they're very tapped out so i've i've found my relational dynamics changing a lot in my 30s based on accessibility and then i don't want to be that weird 30 something single guy complaining about his problems when like your kid just had the flu all night long you know like or like everything just kind of pales in comparison maybe i should find single friends i'm just as i'm talking right now 
I need more single friends. Lit singles. <laughs> we hear you, lit singles, and we love you. I don't know if that answers any of your questions at all, but it sucks. But the beautiful thing about it is my heart has grown by learning to love. I've always loved families, but definitely now that the majority of my friends have families, like learning to love everyone and like creating family space, and especially in a city like Los Angeles, where peop it doesn't always give off the family vibe. It's really cool to know that the majority of my friends have kids or great dogs. Um, <laughs> and we do stuff like with their families. So like I'm missing Prop's uh, daughter's birthday party this weekend, Soul, to be here. Wow. And he, yeah, like they, they wanted me to come and I'll, yeah. So anyway, I feel that. I think it's really interesting how like, universal that experience is of I like man I have some friends why aren't they more like me why are our life stations so different um, and you know we went from this place where we had in the context of an institution like pre-packaged vehicles for connecting with other people in a similar life station which is also kind of fucking insular right like it's 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 at the same time like easy mode for relationships and also so easy to become this hermetically sealed bubble where people aren't sharing the incredible life insights that exist precisely because of the difference in your life station right um, so I'm not saying it was all a panacea but I'm saying what's interesting is we go from easy ready-made cookie cutter homogenous community inside of an institution that in some way was just everybody believed the same stuff. That was literally the measure of like, do you belong or not, is do you believe the same stuff? And that's the relational skills so many of us bring to the table. We don't know how to talk across living situations and relationship arrangements and God help us political orientations like that's impossible different theological beliefs and so we we have this perpetual fear even in our loneliness at least I do of reaching out for fear of not being heard and not being understood and for me, that becomes so uh, disempowering, and it can make me feel hopeless. I'm wondering, like, what stories and experiences do we have, like, in a post-institutional context where friendship really starts to work? There's a few different kinds of friendship too, right? There's friendship, we're just here at the same time experiencing the same thing, and so we have something in common that we can reference later. We went to school at the same time. We were at the same soccer camp. And those threads can be enough to create a relationship. Um, and then there's the other kind of friendship, which is like, like I said before, I am like you in some way. We have similar values, so there's this, uh, this assumption that we don't have to talk about or negotiate the hard things uh, just to find a way to connect. Like, oh, I can assume that you are like me on all of these really fundamental, fundamental things. But I started thinking about friendship differently probably about 10 years ago, and I started asking myself, what if friendship, yes, I have friends in my life who create a sense of belonging for me where I go, oh, I feel seen, I can relax into your presence. But there's also something about friendship that we miss, which is when someone is different from us and they enter into our lives, what gets added that wasn't there before? And what do we get? What, what, how do we grow when we are challenged to see, world, see the world in a different way? So I started thinking about friendship as this avenue to expand my world. And I, I don't want that to sound like I was trying to objectify people and to use them for my yeah. own personal growth, but right. rather like I need some different worldviews to see more that I can't see on my own. So my husband and I made a really difficult decision um, probably about eight years ago to go to a church with people that we don't agree with. To intentionally become part of a community and set down roots with people who had very different theological ideas than we did. 
and it was really, really, really hard. But it continued to remind me that I don't have to only relate to you because you are like me, or that I can find ways that we are like each other that transcend all of the old stories that I thought had to be there for us to be connected. So it makes me want to challenge this idea that relationship has to be comfortable for it to be good. Although I think that having relationships where we're seen and where we feel safe matters. We need those. That's actually part of our flourishing. When we feel lonely, we know that cognitive processing speed decreases, that our brain actually works slower when we're lonely. So we know it has a huge impact on our nervous system. But when we have the ability to see friendship as this thing that adds to our life instead of something that we just use to create comfort or to pass the time, it helps us see how other people who are different than us can add richness to our life. So for me, when I think about it going well, I think about seeing relationship um, with people who are different than me as this huge gift in my life that has helped me negotiate some of the, the strain and challenge that comes with being different from someone. Mm. I love all that so much, and honestly, part of me is like the Enneagram 5 introvert. Uh, part of me goes like, cool for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't want to say that. I felt the same way. I was like, that's cool. <laughs> Not my life. <laughs> like, if I could be Hillary McBride and, and go into a situation, like, meaning you're charming and hilarious and brilliant and outgoing and can go into any scenario and kind of like make it work. Um, that's my perception of you. I, I've seen you in different scenarios. I'm like, wow, that was amazing. Um, and I feel like I'm all thumbs with my whole body. Just a big thumb, just uh, um. I can literally see it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Hi, are you interested in thumbs? Because <laughs> that's what I can talk about. <laughs> You've got to change your Twitter bio to so into thumbs. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not to... So in saying that, though... I've, I've been able to receive enough of that from people, like from you and Lisa and different people in my life who I am always in total admiration of how they can go into any social scene and like be there in a, in a way that makes everybody feel loved and special and seen. And, um, but I've been able to take some of that wisdom and at least love the presence of the other person. If I can't, I don't, I don't have the ability for a lot of people to be able to like find something we can talk about and keep the spark going. Um, you know, like I can't just keep the, the, the vibe going. At some point Bull it's like- Bullshit. <laughs> Bullshit. This man has a, a dated self-conception, y'all. He is talking out of his past and not his present, and I have to call you out on it. Okay? That's a read. If you want to see someone who does not know how to meet new people and how to encounter people, it me. Right here. Okay? I don't have any clue what to do in social interactions. This is literally me, like... Recently, we went to like a LA party in the hills. I felt so weird. So my response was literally to go to the farthest corner of the space where there was like a hundred people in a living room and sit alone on a sofa. Fully suited up too. Full, in a full suit. No one else in a tie. I'm in a full suit. At black suit, black tie, white shirt, whole thing. I think people thought I was like a server or a butler. And so I would go and I would just like sit on the couch and look at the ground. And then surely someone's gonna come talk to me. Cause that's what you do to signal people that you're open and receptive to conversation. 
is you sit alone on a couch and you look at the fucking ground. So, <laughs> unlike Captain of Oneness and Light, who walks into the space open-hearted and just goes up to people and is like, would you like to eye gaze? <laughs> and no, 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 no. Here's the fucked up thing. People are like, yes. <laughs> Strangers, I look over and it's just. And then the next thing you know, they're like this deep soul bond. And he just keeps collecting more and more friends, which, hold on, is great for me. My entire social world consists of people who listen to the Liturgist podcast and therefore can push through my awkwardness and secondhand Vishnu friends. You know how to make friends. <laughs> I, I hope you guys have a look now at what I have to deal with when I go out in public with these two. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. So That's, true. True. That's true. William acts like a, a human person a lot. <laughs> yeah, at, at lunch we had like a... Uh, we were sitting, it was... I was sitting next to Hillary and Jamie Lee Finch and Lisa, and I was like, there is such, like, div this feminine divine energy around me right now. And they're all, like, tapped into it and, like, circled me. They're like, here, let us just give you some mother love. And I'm like... <laughs> Literally weeping. Literally weeping. This is in the, the restaurant here in Hot Springs. <laughs> and just, Mike, I think he's like, normal people doing normal things. <laughs> but William walked in and uh, helped us see the situation from like what human people think about interactions. <laughs> That's normally my response. I'm like, what the fuck are y'all doing? What is happening right now? What the? I love it though, I love it. Well, okay, so I, I will acknowledge that my social life is quite it's quite drastically different than it ever has been in my life. Um, some of that, though, um, speaking of the, the lunch conversation, another one of the conversations that came up with Jamie was uh, we were talking about the river, actually, here, and, and how a river is something that's constantly... It doesn't take the, the water for itself like a puddle. It's like, mine. We better not get rid of any of this. We need to save all this energy up, because what happens then? That's the real five um, tendency for me for most of my life is like, here's relational energy, whatever kind of energy that I have, and I got to protect it, because if that goes, then what? I've got nothing. Um, and really learning to let that go and give it away, to give the little puddle away, uh, has put me in a bigger flow of energy, if that makes any sense. So it, it's not as exhausting when I don't need to like get something from somebody to keep. And, and I'm not going to that objectifying thing where Hillary, which is what I used to do, like, oh, you're somebody that can give me something that I can really hoard here and hold on to for my own goodies. But if it's like I can find a way to enter the flow of your energy and of your life and you into mine, um, and this very esoteric sounding, but it really what it feels like is just laying down in a river. Um, and then it keeps, the river keeps giving itself away and just more and more and the energy just keeps flowing and flowing and there's endless. There's just this endless flow of life and energy. And so one thing practically for me that, that has helped, I think, is I've just tried to pay attention to that energy flow, not just with friendships, but just in my life. And I'm like, am I, am I in a space that is giving, that I'm feeling that flow of life and energy through me in a good way? So uh, if I'm in a, if, I'm, if there's a relationship that just, I, I'm paying attention to what it feels like to be with that person and it feels like the energy's going this way and this way and we can't ever find a, uh, I just don't, I try to honor and value that person, but I don't put much 
value in that relationship. I don't like make that relationship a priority. If there's anything that I find in my life, a relationship, a podcast, a book, whatever is the, the thing that I'm finding that, that juice, that energy, that life in, I just make it a priority to like swim in it as much as I can. Um, so I love seeing the people, the people that are in the liturgist, so many of us have been lonely. And then when you come to like the events that we do, the gatherings, and it's funny and amazing to see how little you care about us on the stage a lot of times, uh, and you're just finding each other. Because there's just like this, you know that you're here for a common, there's a common energy that brought you to this room, and now you get to flow together, and you find this. I think that's really inspiring, people that like go to the places, put their money on the line, put their time on the line, to go into the spaces that they can feel that that flow of energy, of life, of love. Um, and the more that I've just done that with my life, I've just found that I'm less lonely. I, it hasn't been that I've sought out friendships or have any really great practical, first, here's your icebreakers. I got none of that shit. I still feel awkward, honestly, a lot of times. But if my heart just opens into the flow of, of that moment, uh, I just find myself over time being less lonely. I love that. Um I think what Mike's saying is so true because it's like you got to find friendship where there's love and where there's commonality, but yes, there are differences. And I often found people that I have strong differences with is where I've often found some of the most love, which is really surprising because you think it's the opposite sometimes. And we can be very different in personality, but, but share a common like love energy for each other. Um, and so, I don't know, my motto is find the love and follow it wherever that leads you, and, and, and I'm saying this as well to myself as I'm saying it to you, stop, stop looking for people who are not showing you love. Stop following or trying to like after people, even if they were former friends who just sort of moved on, like let them go, leave them. <laughs> they don't love you. <laughs> Maybe they do, but they just don't love you in that moment. And so find the people that you uh, feel the love from wherever that is and oftentimes you do find it when you put yourself in very different scenarios And I just know if you do that you're you're not going to be lacking of love like Michael said go with the, where the flow and the energy is leading you And if the flow of your life is leading you in a certain direction with friends It doesn't matter if you wish to be over there with those people be with the people who just love you and want to be with you And uh, I don't know. I think it's really that simple for me I think about um how when we're really longing for something and we get it, there's like a desperation that makes us want to close our fist around it. Like you read of mice and men and Lenny has the mice or the rabbits or whatever they are and he squeezes them to death because he loves them so much. That when there's something that we're longing for, it can be so painful in that moment to get it and to know it's gonna end. And so one of the strategies and I think this resonates with what you're saying, both of you, is, is when we're feeling connection, whether it turns into friendship or not, it's our job to not start telling a story about how it's gonna be over and how awful that is, and then remember that experience of connection and the only memory that we has, have of that connection was that we knew it was gonna be over. Right? So when we're with something, trying to really be with it, when we glimpse somebody's eye at the grocery store, and they say, how are you? And we look back and we really see them for that moment. Allowing ourselves to be with that glimpse of connection and to stay with it in a way that doesn't then tell stories about what isn't there. Yeah. To really honor the experience of connection as we see them. And what's beautiful about that is when we do that, we start noticing them all over the place. I think that um, one of my primary strategies in working with people who experience depression is to support them to become detectives of joy. There is pain everywhere. There is loneliness everywhere. It is actually, I would say, a guarantee in life for there to be pain and ache and longing and wounding. What we can do, though, is start looking and being curious for the places of connection when they do show up and starting to really treasure them and savor them without squishing them to death when they do happen.
Yeah, and don't you think that there's like an element of making that a priority for you? How how important is that for you? Like when you think of following that connection, like the fact that you said yes to being on this podcast when you got so much other stuff in your life, but there was like this, when we met you, Mike and I, we first talked to you, there was that, oh, this feels, there's a connection, this feels like an important relationship. Even though we just met you, there's that buzz, right? And it's like, what can we do? To me, that's like such a priority to like, taking care of and loving that connection and, and letting it be what it, all that it can be. Um, how much of that, like is that a big priority for you? I imagine it's somewhat of a priority uh, for you to say yes to this crazy podcast while you're doing all this other stuff. Um, but how do you prioritize that? And think Prior that? I don't really understand the question. So <laughs> how do you detect joy? How do you detect, how do you, how important it is for me? Is it for me to build relationship or how do I do that? Yeah, I mean, again, here's coming from Five Land, but from Five Land, I, it's more natural for me to put like ideas and work and I'm not naturally like human connection. That's where I need to prioritize in my life. Uh, but the more that I have prioritized it, it's changed a bit. And I'm just wondering, it seems more natural for, it seems from my perspective more natural to you, but do you think about it as like, uh, I'm going to prioritize this, or does it just feel more natural? To oh, that's such an important question that I, I feel like I'm constantly wrestling with because my job is relationships, too. Like, as a therapist, the currency of my skill is to help people feel seen, and yet, in the process, I disappear, right? Like, I'm with people connecting all day, but none of them know anything about me. So it creates a challenge uh, for me in terms of feeling seen, and... And when I am seen, and this is reinforced to kind of a shame story that I've worked through in my life, they see me because I've helped them and praise me for that. And so it, it can feel like the only way to connect is to give everyone else what they need. So for me, finding spaces where I feel seen is a priority. When I feel seen by somebody and I feel like there's the synchronistic uh, yeah. spark and energy, it feels to me like that moves to the top of my list. And what I've noticed is that when those those relationships aren't there, that my behavior and my inner landscape becomes increasingly unhealthy. That it's easy for me to work longer hours and to write more papers and to get stuck doing all sorts of things that might look great um, and might feel meaningful, especially if let's say I'm, you know, I'm doing some research project that everyone's like, that's gonna change the way we do treatment for something. I'm like, oh, it's very meaningful, I have to do it. But then the people in my life can't say, hey, you're, you're working too much. So the relationships that I have actually, although they in some ways take time, it takes time to build relationship, it takes time to invest, they're the, the people who keep me the healthiest. They help me see things and parts of myself that I don't, I don't normally see. But one of the things that I've learned in being a therapist is that my, my, life, my life energy, a lot of my life's work is sitting across from people with no distractions. I'm not on my phone at all. I'm not checking email. I'm trying to hear everything that's said and unsaid. And I think that the training that that gives me is that when I'm with someone, I try to really be with them, not to be there and somewhere else. And I think that makes it easier to feel that connection that I was talking about, to be at the grocery store and to see someone's eyes as they're bagging your groceries and go, oh, we see each other. Because I have spent a lot of my time and work over years learning to put the distractions aside when there is somebody in front of me. And then I think it means that meditation is a kind of relationship. That when you are with someone, there is, or sorry, relationship is a kind of meditation. That when you are with someone and you are fully present, um, that you can really be with whatever's happening. So putting phones away, right? So when you say you see someone in the grocery store, you see them or do you see them? What does that mean? You know what I mean. No, ask it differently. Because you know that do there's that type of- you see them or see them? I see them. What does that mean? You, does anyone know what Are he's talking Are you spelling about? these words differently? Or yeah. <laughs> I see them. You see them. What do you mean? No, tell me again. Try again. I'm listening. I'm just saying sometimes it's not always the pl the seeing is not always <laughs> the seeing okay. is not always platonic. This, okay. Sometimes folks are just seeing you. Hillary would be the one to be like, oh my God, we had a loving, congenital connection. I'm like, no, that dude was checking you out. It's very, 
It's very different. <laughs> you might have had that like energy. <laughs> It's weird when people are lonely and you pay them attention, they're like, I love you. <laughs> like, I don't love you, but I also love you, but not that way. She used to tell me that all the time. <laughs> uh, Hillary, in this like discussion of relationship and loneliness and how hard that is, you know, I'm reflecting on how shitty the tool set people who grew up in white Christian contexts were given for relationship building. You know, we get this like, our relationships are as deep as the casserole dish they were formed over, right? <laughs> like, oh, it's something to do other than watch TV. Talk to another person about casserole. sports, how good casserole is, and weather. Yay. Right? There's not, and Bible, yeah. There's not this like deep, deep well. And I've been so guilty of that in my life. You know, the, the kind of arc that led to my first book, Finding God in the Way, is available everywhere, um, <laughs> was me reading and learning from books. But like the last few years of my life, all the great things have not come from books, they've come from people, right? Like, I meet Michael, and everything I think that is weird about me that I should be ashamed of, Michael thinks are fucking amazing. <laughs> like, and laughs about, and that gave me such self-confidence that like, maybe I'm not bizarre. Maybe I'm okay. And then I meet William. And William uh, is um, not about the white nonsense of friendship. <laughs> William's like, what if, and, and, just, and just try this, what if we're not just like mutually self-sufficient with each other? What if we're in relationship? What if part of being in relationship is you sharing some of that vulnerability tank with me? And if your vulnerability tank is all the time, why don't we do the work together of getting a bigger vulnerability tank? It's not a finite resource in friendship, right? Like being friends with William has fundamentally changed my posture towards being not only in community, but in friendship. And then I met Hillary, and everything I thought about me that was warped or wrong or broken, Hillary, just by her gracious and kind presence, showed me that some of the things I hate about myself are the things that kept me alive through a really difficult childhood. And Hillary's constant encouragement and acceptance of the times that I'm coming unglued, right? Humpty Dumpty has to fall before he can be put back together sometimes. That gentle, patient assurance helped me grow. But I didn't have the tool set to form those relationships. And I wonder, Hillary, if you could just tell us, like, what are some things people can do to start the process of moving into greater relationship? You just showed us some of them, right? Like, what I want to say is I'm so deeply touched, and, and I would like to, for your sake, produce tears after Mike said that to show you how much it meant to me. But the truth is, he tells me that all the time, right? He's really, really vocal about how he feels about us. And I think one of the things... <laughs> I, I got the tears for you. There it is. There it is. Is that part of the way that we have, I think, not just Mike and each of us individually, but the four of us built a friendship around things that, I mean, intersecting identities and life experiences that might make us seem like a kind of weird bunch is that we tell each other all the time how we feel about each other and what we're learning from each other. And I think that's one of the things that helps us build friendship is seeing goodness in the other people and acknowledging it and letting them know, you have impacted me, you matter to me. Telling people that we don't have to be so afraid and we also don't have to say that and expect anything back as if it needs to be an exchange of vulnerability. Right. It is okay to tell people that they matter to you just because it's good for them to know, not because you need to hear it back too. 
So when we think about wrapping this up and some of the skills that help us move into relationship, into connection, I want to circle back to some of the things that I said already, that, that when we meet people, instead of seeing, how am I different than you, asking ourselves, how am I like you? What is, there, what is here that draws a thread of connection that allows me to see that you have worth and value and could believe the same about me? And I don't think that means that we only ever connect with people just because we have everything the same, but rather seeing some bigger story of connectivity that because we're human and we're alive and we have life experiences that have shaped us and teach us to see the world in a unique way, that we all have something to offer to each other. There is no other place we would go and sweat this hard and love it so much. Uh, you have no idea how instrumental Wild Goose has been in the work we do and the way that we feel. And the open-hearted spirit that's here is beautiful and teaches us how to be in good relationship as well. Wild Goose, we love you so much. And thanks for spending time with us today. Thank you.